we continue to get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God should look like this week as we hear a preview of fearless love as we continue reading through the letter of 1 John. So our scripture text for today is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9 and 16 through 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. Those verses in that text contain two of my favorite truths in the whole Bible. Number one, God is love. And number two, perfect love drives out fear. The first one helps you understand God better, and the second one helps you get through life better. God is love. Perfect love drives out fear. People often wonder what God is like. And on the one hand, that question is so deep, we will be learning more about the answer for our entire lives. But on the other hand, the summary of the answer isn't a complicated secret at all because God is love, period. It's a simple truth that takes a lifetime to fully understand. So that, number one, can help us when we wonder what God is like. And what about times when you're really worried in life, or you're anxious, or you're freaking out? What can help then? Number two, love drives out fear. So look for more love, and it will help you in those fearful, anxious moments. If you only remember two things from the sermon and worship service today, let it be those two truths from our verses. God is love, and love drives out fear. Verses 7 through 9 shows us how that first truth, God is love, plays out in our lives. And I thought the verses kind of sounded like a math equation. God equals love, A equals B. So if you've got A, then you've got B and vice versa. God is love. So verse 7 says that if you've got love, then you've got God. And verse 8 says that if you don't have love, then you don't have God because God and love are the same thing. So if you want more God in your life, then grow more love in your life. And if you want more love in your life, then put more God in your life. Now, that is an easy thing to say, but we should admit that it's not quite an easy thing to do. In fact, putting more love into our lives is a bit of a challenge, which is why a lot of people don't want to do it and don't even try. You can see how hard it is by looking at Jesus' life and sacrifice and execution. It takes a lot of strength to practice humility, and it takes a lot of courage 
to make big sacrifices. But Jesus did all that. Why? Because he had great love. Since it's hard and it takes a lot of confidence to show love, we can't just notice that we're lacking and flip a switch like a light switch so that from then on we are only happy, sweet, godly, loving people nonstop. It's not that easy. But fortunately, Jesus, as always, can help. Through his teaching, he said that if we want to get more love, then we need to show more love, to kind of grease the gears of the love from God that flows through us. We need to show more so we can get more. And he gave good examples at the end of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount when he told the crowds listening to him that they needed more love in their lives. But when Jesus taught about love, he wasn't talking about a warm, fuzzy, lovey-dovey, rainbows and unicorns, kind of sweet, sugary candy feeling of love. He was talking about action. To Jesus, love is something you do. If you want to be a man or woman of action who has true integrity, then follow Jesus and show great love because Jesus' kind of love is action-oriented. If someone asks you for something, give it to them plus extra. If someone wants you to carry something one mile, carry it for two. If they want to borrow something, loan it to them without expecting anything back. If someone is hungry, feed them. If they need clothes, give them some clothes. If they're alone, invite them over. That's what Jesus said. You grow more love by showing more love in your actions and in your work and your service. Practice being a person of love. And the more you practice, the better you'll get. It won't be easy, but it's worth it. It's kind of like exercising or going to the gym. Whatever result you're wanting, that kind of change, it isn't going to happen immediately overnight. It takes work, it takes effort and time. And a Jesus kind of love to develop is a lot like that. A Jesus kind of love requires a lot of effort and time. It requires you to give a lot and to help a lot. Even to give and help people you might not know. Even people you might not like. That one's hard. Maybe that's why we don't practice love as much as we should. We're hesitant, wary, nervous, Scared to take a risk, scared to be vulnerable, to put ourselves out there, scared to make a sacrifice or stick our neck out on the line. So what can we do about that? Well, fortunately, our text gives us the answer again. If you want less anxiety and fear in your life, then let more of God's love into your life. And that's because, it says in verse 18, there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear. Oh, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Not being afraid anymore, not being worried, not being stressed out about things like, I don't know, viruses, or infection, or health, or healing. Gosh, we've been afraid so long, we wouldn't even know what to do with ourselves if we stopped being worried and anxious, you know? The Dunkin' Donuts commercials say that America runs on Dunkin', but sometimes I think it runs on fear instead. That does seem like the biggest motivator in our decisions as a society 
Fear of everything. Fear of falling behind. Fear of losing what we have. Fear of getting hurt. Afraid someone will take advantage of us. Afraid that someone will get, someone they, get something they don't deserve. Afraid that they won't get what they do deserve. Afraid, afraid, afraid. Ugh. How much happier would our country be if America really ran on donuts instead, right? A donut-based society? Yes, that is a happy country right there. Not so much a healthy one physically, but a very, very happy one. I wouldn't mind the change. <sighs> but no, sadly, we are motivated more so by fear than donuts. Maybe that's why there's so many phobia names out there. Because whatever thing you can think of in the world, somebody is afraid of that. Even things you would never think people would be afraid of, there's a name for that. Of course, we know some of the more familiar ones, familiar fears and phobias like claustrophobia, a fear of tight spaces, or arachnophobia, a fear of spiders. There's also fear of heights, right? That's called acrophobia, acro, fear of heights. Some people have a fear of flying. That's called aviophobia. Others you can understand, even if you don't have them, they might be things like a fear of thunder and lightning is astrophobia. Makes sense. What about anyone have a fear of dentists? That's called dentophobia. That uh, does kind of flare up every six months when it's time for that cleaning. Or what about coimetrophobia, a fear of cemeteries? Sure, sure. What about this one, triskaidekaphobia? That's the fear of the number 13. I think we all might have a little bit of that. Sometimes if you're ever in a high-rise hotel, see if they have a 13th floor or not. Many do not because it's bad luck. It means they are triskaidekaphobic. But then there's also names for what we might think are fears that really don't make sense, like omphalophobia, a fear of belly buttons. <laughs> or what about torophobia, a fear of cheese? Oh, so sad. That would be so sad. What about ablutophobia, fear of washing or cleaning? Perhaps that's what plagues so many college students, blutophobia. What about globophobia, a fear of balloons, strange. Cyanophobia, fear of the color blue. This one though, I don't know, I might have this one. Nomophobia, fear of being out of cell phone contact. I think we might have developed that one over the years. But there are a lot of strange ones out there. We could go on. I just kind of, out of curiosity, looked up some different ones. We could go on and on because there's a phobia for everything. But if you don't want to be afraid of every bad, scary thing in the world, then here's the answer. God and love. When you are worried about something, or your fears begin to creep up on you, or you feel the anxiety rising, then remember the words of our Old Testament reading today. Psalm 27, 14 said, Be strong and let your heart take courage. So do that. Be strong and let your heart take courage. How? By letting more of God's presence into your life. And how do you do that? By putting more love into your life and showing it. They both increase the other as we practice. But the one who fears is not made perfect in love, our text said in verse 18. So if you find yourself afraid of something, then that should tell you you've got some work to do. But don't worry, we all have work to do. We're all human, so we're all afraid of something. Will I have enough put away for retirement? Are my kids really okay? How long will I be healthy? Am I doing a good job at work? 
We're all afraid of something. So what are you worried about? What stresses you out? Is it your health, responsibilities, your appearance, your parents, what people think of you? We could go on and on. Some people are afraid of of big things like terrorist attacks, even though you're actually four times more likely to get struck by lightning than to be struck by a terrorist attack. But some things just feel scarier than others, despite what the reality is and what the actual risk is. For example, do you know what the biggest threat to your life is? It's your own heart. That's true. Heart problems are the number one cause of death in America. And you are 35,000 times more likely to die from heart problems than from a terrorist attack. And yet how much do we worry about one over the other? And how much money do we put into government programs to keep our hearts secure and healthy, even though that's our real risk? The biologist E.O. Wilson says that we fear the scary stuff like snakes and spiders and darkness and tight spaces, but we're not really as scared of what is actually a threat to our lives because He says, our species has not been aware of those lethal agents long enough to develop the predisposing genes that ensure automatic avoidance. That's kind of biologist talk to mean that we haven't yet evolved to be scared of the things in our modern world that are actually threats to our lives. Instead, we still have some of our cavemen fears we've inherited to things that feel scary, even though they're not really a risk. Fear, real fear, deep fear, the kind that that makes you change direction or move or jerk is not something that tends to follow sensible facts or risks to our actual bodies. And you can take me as an example, I will admit it. If I see a spider in my house, then for a few moments, temporarily, I lose my mind, all right? I revert back to my caveman psyche and I go into hunter-gatherer mode. And I, will, I go on high alert, I'm tense, I tense up, especially in the bigger the ones, that's well, the more tense. And so first I, I watch it, and I might, I might ask Sarah or the boys, hand, hand me a weapon, hand me a weapon. You know, like a sandal or paper towel, one of those really lethal weapons, you know, paper towel. Because I, I don't want to keep my eyes off it, I don't want it, they dart, those spiders, I don't, want, I don't want it to hide. So I keep my eyes on it, hand me a weapon, okay. So I, I track my prey across the plains of the living room, and then I strike. And no joke, when I strike, I shout. I yell and shout. I can't help it. It's some weird, I don't know, caveman thing in me that makes no sense. That spider can't threaten my life, but it triggers something in me. And yet I can drive on the interstate at 70 miles an hour and my vehicle next to a huge Mack truck that's barreling down faster than I am I'm not concerned. I'm listening to the radio. I'm humming along. I'm not actually scared of the things that can hurt us. We are too often guided by fears instead of facts because fear is an emotional reaction and no amount of facts can stop it. You can tell somebody all the true facts in the whole world, all the data, all the science from all the experts, but that won't make them any less afraid because facts can't drive out fear. Only love can. When someone's afraid, no matter how much you tell them what the situation really is, facts won't drive out fear. 
Only love will. If someone says, I'm so worried that I won't pass this test, you say, oh, stop worrying. You know all the material. They say, but I'm just still so worried. Facts don't drive out fear. Only love does. So if they say, I'm so worried I won't pass this test, you can say, you know what? I love you and God loves you and we're going to love you the whole time you take that test and we're going to love you afterward no matter what happens. They might say, oh, thank you. You know, I do feel a little better now. Love drives out fear because love is stronger than any information or facts or any thing, even memory. There's a British actor named Christopher Eccleston who's done everything from Shakespeare to Doctor Who and lots of stuff in between. And he said that his father, Ronnie, at the end of his life had Alzheimer's and dementia. And often his father, Ronnie, would forget that Christopher was his son. But he always seemed to remember his wife, Elsie. But as the condition became more severe, there was a moment when Elsie said, Ronnie, do you know who I am? And he looked at her really hard and he said, yeah, of course I do. And she said, well, who am I? And he looked at her even harder and he said, well, I don't know exactly, but I know I love you. That's what I know. Love is stronger than anything. Memory, fear, facts. Love is the strongest force there is. And that's why God is love. Number one, God is love. And love drives out our fear. So be strong. Let your heart take courage. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Because God's love is with you wherever you go. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that so often we are guided and motivated by our fears and our worries. Sometimes we are overcome by them. We ask your forgiveness for our weakness because indeed we cannot help it. But we are so thankful that you cannot help but love us no matter what. So thank you for loving us nonstop, overwhelmingly, even those times when we don't notice. We ask that we would feel and notice more of your love today so that we can show it more to others and put it into action to help this be a world of more love and less fear, a world that looks more like your kingdom. Help us to be strong this week and let our hearts take courage. Amen.